All right, hello, good morning, and uh, welcome once again to my little run-through of St. Francis of Assisi, a biography by Omar uh, Engelbert. Uh, this is part three. I have a hunch it'll take me two more parts uh, to get through this, so we'll uh, keep going, and we're a little after, a little more than two-thirds through, uh, through the book, uh, so that, that kind of makes sense. And uh, just for the record, before I get going, I've never done a video series, you know, like this. So I decided to wear a different jacket every time to keep the videos, you know, um, identifiable, you know. So, uh, Merry Christmas, I guess. Uh, for the record, also, uh, this print is called Santa Boss. So, I don't get to wear this very often. Anyway, we are actually going to be covering uh, some of the more uh, powerful struggles in Francis's life this time. I'm going to start with something positive, and then we'll we'll go on to, you know, more of his struggles, and that'll probably continue for some of the later chapters as well. So I'm on the third order right now, starting on page two thirty one. Now the third order was basically the the rule or order uh, meant for everybody who wanted to kind of follow in Francis's footsteps without formally becoming a friar. Uh, so Francis, you know, wrote something which was basically the first draft. It, this is not what the rule ended up being. But here's what Francis wrote. This is what he wanted everybody in the world to understand. The people coming to him like, hey Francis, how do we live the life of Christ? Uh, in our daily lives. So this doesn't apply just to priests or monks or friars. This is meant for everybody. So here we go. Uh, they deserve to be called blessed who love the Lord and do what the gospel teaches. And what does it teach? To love God with a pure heart, to worship him in spirit and in truth, and to pray without ceasing preferring for this the Lord's Prayer, and to receive the Lord's body and blood in communion. We ought, moreover, to be good Catholics, to visit churches, and to confess our sins to the priests, who, though sinners themselves, are nonetheless God's ministers and deserving of our respect. The Gospels likewise commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Let us then do good instead of evil to our brothers. If our function be to judge, let us judge mercifully. If it be to command with indulgence, deeming ourselves the servants of others. If our role is to obey, let us obey humbly, unless the thing commanded should be a sin. Let us avoid excess of the table, let us do penance, and let us give generously to the poor. In fine, let us be simple, humble, and pure, rather than wise and prudent, according to the flesh. That was basically the paragraph expressing what Francis wanted of his order, of, of the people following in his footsteps, officially or unofficially. That's what he wanted to pass on. And it didn't, um, it wasn't received very well. Because at this point in history, the, uh, and by point in history, let me see if I can give you a date, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, written in 1226. So at this point, um, Francis's followers had kind of divided into two camps. There were people that wanted to copy Francis completely, like absolutely no money, no property, no clothing, you know, just, just living the poor life. And there were other people that wanted to take some of what Francis was talking about and kind of make it like other religious orders of the day. The most common one that's compared to is the Dominicans. Uh, and there was great back and forth going on between these two camps. Um, and obviously Francis wanted, you know, people to, you know, copy him exactly. That's what he wanted. Uh, he saw that those changes that were being um, suggested were not 
we're not really in the spirit of you know what he was doing and trying to trying to create so you know he was frustrated because uh, when they when they started reviewing that document uh, they they took out most of the references to the gospel and Francis being you know kind of a simple guy he wasn't dumb but he also wasn't well educated in scripture or anything like that so when he would write a sermon or a letter he would he would always depend upon the wisdom of the gospels more than his own words so it says right here on page 256 how was he to let his heart speak and appeal from it to the hearts and loyalty of his friars in a dry administrative ordinance in which he was no longer permitted to quote the gospel especially now when he had so much to say and insist on when he sensed his authority reduced his adversaries becoming more and more powerful and his ideal less and less followed so this is this is the great pain of Francis's life he did this great thing you know just just himself his life and then he started gathering followers which he didn't necessarily expect early on but once he got so many followers he found it harder and harder to lead them as a shepherd because they wanted to do their own thing they wanted to be with him in name but they kind of wanted to shape the order according to their will rather than the original vision that got them to this point in the first place and and that was very painful for saint francis um, but it says right here this is a good counter argument um you know referring to the pope that was kind of taking sides with uh francis's adversaries with respect to how the rule will be you know in place you know more administrative ordinance less gospel you know that sort of thing so in defense of that pope um pope gregory the ninth uh evidence is lacking however for so flat a condemnation was it his fault if the ideal of the little poor man could be entirely realized only by a few exceptional souls the moment that this ideal becomes the common property of several thousand men it had to be watered down as it were in order to remain accessible to all who could possibly make heroism and holiness the common law of the world and i think that's a very powerful message that that doesn't just apply to saint francis's vision it applies to all of christianity when we really live the gospel in so many ways that is heroism and holiness and we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking that it's the common law of the world it is heroic to follow christ one one very specific way we can talk about this is the institution of marriage you know some people say that marriage was easier back then because people didn't live as long you know people just living together with one person forever they, they didn't know any better and that's really not true gk chesterton writes a whole bunch about this marriage has always been difficult marriage has always been a challenge and a sacrifice for for both parties you are giving yourself to another and yeah if we look at that with objective eyes that is scary and that is it is nothing less than heroic to get married in the full sense of the word in the eyes of the church it is heroic and it is holy and i think the reason people don't get married as often as we'd like them to or the reason that the divorce rate is so high is i think we take it for advantage we, we excuse me we take for granted the idea that marriage is the common law when in fact although marriage is common in the sense that it's kind of the way things go i mean there's reason for that of course i'm not not saying uh only a very small portion of the population should get married we should remember <clears throat> that marriage is exceptional it is heroic and holy and that means it takes work and sacrifice 
I, I read that in between the lines, you know, here about St. Francis and what he was trying to achieve in his life. And uh, a couple pages later, I'm on 263 right now. Of all the little poor man's sufferings, the most dreadful was that which marked the period we have just studied. You know, this back and forth about administration and rules and not being able to proclaim the gospel as much. It was the one referred to by his biographers when, without being more specific, they speak of St. Francis's great temptation. This was a unique trial, a torture particularly long and cruel, a distress of conscience so serious and profound that divine intervention was necessary to deliver him from it. It was the sort of intense anguish in which the little poor man, almost abandoned by God, walked in darkness, a prey to indecision and doubt, almost, it would seem, to the point of despair. So basically, he was seeing these actions of his brothers as betrayal. And it was absolutely overwhelming for him to spend so much time and energy struggling against the very people he loved the most. And I can personally attest that this is one of the most exhausting, most spiritually draining things in life. When, when you are betrayed by the very people closest to you, the people you're trying to serve, you know, your family, your friends, um, parishioners, your spouse, whatever the case, betrayal that close to you will always be a remarkably painful experience. And St. Francis, one of the holiest people to ever live, was not immune to that. And the difficulties he suffered from the, the personal contention between him and other people was way worse than any bodily harm that he went through, through the extremes of, of, of the world, from going hungry countless nights, all of that paled in comparison to basically being betrayed and, and hurt by the people closest to him. So let's not underestimate our ability to do evil to one another by turning on one another in so many ways. You know, there's, there's so many ways we can go about going down that dark road. So that is definitely something I want you all to remember and learn from the life of St. Francis. It's not bodily torture that we should fear. It's turning on one another and cruelty toward one another that perhaps does the most damage to us in the long run. I'm going to end on that dark note. It's uh, Saturday morning right now. I'm going to get some other videos out for my homilies and a full mass from Heart of the Nation. We're going to wrap this up early next week between Monday and Wednesday, uh, somewhere between there. Again, I think I need two more videos. I'm choosing to end on a dark note now because we're going to deal with the solution in the fourth and fifth video of this series. So be sure to stay tuned. There is a solution. But for now, think about that pain and torture, that betrayal and heartache really causes. And see you next week. God bless.